Um, and welcome back, everyone. Uh, as you can hear, uh, we have switched languages. We are now continuing this day in English. This is to be inclusive towards our speakers, um, most of whom will not be fluent in Dutch. Uh, also, they will themselves be presenting in English. Uh, we have a packed afternoon program for you. But before we start with our speakers, I would like to remind you that recording of this um, of this session is happening. So that means that if you do not want to appear in the recording of these sessions, we would advise you to keep your camera switched off. And uh, if you uh, don't want your name to be visible either, you can remove your name from your Zoom profile. That way you will not be visibly recognizable in the Zoom recording. Um, so that's happening. And then Miriam just said in Dutch, and I will repeat it in English, we would very much like everyone who wants to participate in the final panel session of this afternoon, which starts just after four o'clock, to find during the breaks in their rooms, in their homes, one item that is red and one item that is green. And we will tell you what to do with those items when we get to the afternoon panel session, which starts five past four. So um, thank you for starting to think about that. Just for the people who joined us in the afternoon who've missed the morning program, we had some splendid uh, guests who've uh, spoken to us about a variety of topics. Um, we had uh, Andre from uh, Nyenrode who brought Habermas into the conversation. He talked about the, the, the power of dialogue. Uh, we had a presentation from Manon de Jong, um, who spoke about the Dutch Citizens Assembly back in 2006, where she was uh, someone who was involved in many ways with that uh, and focusing on the psychological aspects of it. We heard from Francisca Eckhart, who is promotes, uh, who's, who's getting her PhD tomorrow uh, on, a, uh, on a work that she did reviewing multiple processes of the G1000 and uh, talking about the strengths uh, and the, uh, the points that need to be strengthened uh, of the, the way citizens assemblies are being uh, conducted. And at the very start of the day, uh, we had a, a splendid introduction from Alex Brenningmeier, who's advising the Dutch government about democracy and who said, citizens assemblies, just do it. Um, so that's what we did this morning. Um, very pleased that uh, so many people are still with us for the afternoon when we're going to be speaking to each other in English. We are going to listen to four different speakers from uh, different countries across Europe. Um, and the first person that I would like to introduce to you uh, is going to be Björn, um, who's joining us from Denmark. He's with the Danish Board of Technology. He's a deputy director there. Um, and uh, he's going to tell us uh, a couple of things about his work on deliberative democracy and citizens assemblies and their impact. So please over to you, Björn Betstedt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and apologies for not speaking Dutch, um, but rather home, homemade English. Um, I understand there might be uh, a problem with my microphone. So, I mean, uh, Han, maybe just put a, an image or, or something on, on your screen if, if there's a problem and I can try to speak louder or move uh, closer. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit all over the place today. I'll first give a brief introduction to the Danish Climate Assembly. Then I'll make a few comparisons between that and the French Climate Assembly. Uh, mostly I will discuss the role of citizen assemblies and other mini publics in policy making. And finally, uh, about their role at different uh, governance levels. So I hope that's not too far from what I promised Ham I would speak about. Um, okay, now I need to go down, yeah. Um, 
about the Danish climate assembly, uh, the task it was given or citizens were given were to provide input to how Denmark can meet its legally binding target of 70% reduction of greenhouse emissions by 2030. Um, the assembly is part of a political agreement uh, behind the Danish Climate Act. So the politicians ask for it, um, but I think it's fair to say that none of them knew what they were asking for exactly. Um, the Danish Board of Technology has designed the method and uh, the process flow, and we were in charge of uh, facilitating what we call the first phase. Uh, the second phase continues this fall. So due to COVID, uh, the entire, <coughs> sorry, the entire first phase uh, took place online using Zoom, SharePoint, and an online citizen engagement platform, Engage Suite, that was developed by BIOS. I'm not going into details here, but uh, we can talk later about it at the breakout rooms if, if uh, needed. Um, uh, one feature about this uh, I would like to mention now is that uh, this was designed to provide very early input to ongoing climate negotiations about CO2 taxes and land use. And, and hence, uh, we had the early meeting in, uh, in November uh, with the Climate uh, Committee and the Danish Parliament. But after that, it opened up uh, and became a more traditional uh, citizen assembly process. Um, in terms of political response, um, there's been a couple of meetings with the political committee in parliament. Uh, recommendations have been discussed in the Green Committee in the, in the government, uh, how exactly we, we don't really know. Uh, and the Climate and Energy Committee uh, made a promise to make a report about the recommendations after they have discussed it in the committee. Uh, we're still waiting for that one. It's, uh, this hasn't really changed a lot between phase one and phase two, which starts now, so the promises one to two meetings with the, the parliamentary committee, uh, plus a minister, uh, the Danish climate minister. Um, so, I mean, compared to the French climate assembly, you can say that in Denmark, no promises really were made, which is very Danish. And in France, big promises were made, which is very French. Uh, the Danish was remarkably underfunded. Uh, the French had a huge budget. Uh, there was little media and international attention to the Danish assembly and lots of media attention and international attention to the French. Danish was online, French face to face. Um, and in Denmark, then, there's no clear policy response to citizens' recommendations yet. Uh, but my impression is that in France, at least some of the recommendations have been adopted in one form or another by policymakers. Um, an important difference is that um, there's a second phase in Denmark. And there's a discussion if there's going to be a continuation after that. In uh, France, it's a one-off, and uh, uh, I'm not sure how big discussions they have about a possible continuation. So, uh, to me, the lessons learned from um, from France and, and Denmark is that um, we're still at the early stages of figuring out what role these assemblies can and should play in different national and in international policy systems. 
roughly put, I think that two big promises were made in France and too few commitments were made in, uh, in Denmark. Maybe um, that's how it works best in France with a more flamboyant culture. And in Denmark, uh, it's a much more cautious political culture. And I would call it work in progress where policymakers are still in the early stages of understanding and determining what their role should be and what kind of response and interaction they should have to and with uh, the climate assembly. Um, I think the role of policymakers is something we have to be much more practical about. So there seems to be widespread uh, agreement among academics and practitioners that a successful citizen participation process requires both some degree of political buy-in and collaboration and well-designed and executed participation processes. But whereas manuals for practical implementation of mini public processes are quite abundant, concrete and detailed guidelines for policymakers are not. And I think it is fair to say that the same goes for impact uh, evaluation frameworks. So I think there's a lot more practical work to be done in terms of fleshing out exactly how policymakers could and should react to and interact with citizen participation processes. Um, this is one of the tasks we are working on in uh, NOCA, the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies, uh, initiated by European Climate Foundation. Um, I'm pretty sure that Graham, who is chairing this network, will say more about it. Uh, but since I speak before him, I get to mention it first. Um, um, so some of the critique uh, of the Danish Citizen Assembly has been from, from civil society organizations um, has been that the political promise with regards to political implementation of citizen recommendations have been both too weak and too unclear. So they think of impact as politicians um, turning recommendations into legislation. From uh, the side of researchers, the, the critique has mainly been that, um, uh, that the policy uptake or the, the promises made by politicians have been too unclear and that politicians have paid too little results to, uh, uh, too little attention to the results. Um, from the perspective of the Danish climate ministry, uh, and here's something in Danish, uh, sorry about that. Uh, but they consider the recommendations from the citizens equal to a set of reports that the government has requested from 14 so-called climate partnerships, uh, which include suggestions from different sectors in the Danish society about how they can contribute to reaching the 70% reduction target, transport, agriculture, and so on. So what this means in practice is that the citizens' recommendations will lie in the ministry drawer together with these climate partnerships reports, but they will be consulted every time the ministry has to prepare new climate uh, legislation, which they will be doing on a regular basis uh, over the coming years. Uh, they will be implemented in a set of different uh, legislations for different sectors and, and, uh, and different governance tools. So I'm not sure how to assess uh, that kind of impact. Is that a desirable version of the policy response that deliberative democracy proponents would like to see? Are civil servants just as important 
as politicians. What do we mean when we ask for a policy response? Um, as a practitioner, I obviously think that policymakers should be obliged to respond somehow to what citizens recommend. But I don't think they should simply turn citizens' recommendations into legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, we might collectively agree to give such assemblies that power in the future, but we are not there yet at all. And I think, I also think it would be a mistake to make that the overarching goal of citizen participation. So what do we do in the meantime? I think that by focusing the discussion too much on the power balance between citizens and policymakers, we risk shortcutting the bigger discussion about the role of citizen participation in deliberative democracy. We want to promote institutionalization of citizen participation, but we also mean different things by it. Um, my own opinion is that rather than having one citizen participation institution, such as a second chamber uh, uh, as a citizen assembly, I would prefer to have a deliberative culture with a wide range of different citizen participation tools and practices. Another way of uh, putting it is to distinguish between thin and thick democracy. And I would argue that ideas about a second chamber run the risk of falling into the category of thin democracy. And that brings me to another discussion about the role of citizen assemblies. Um, to the hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and I think it is important to remind ourselves about the fairly large number of citizen participation methods, each of which can play different roles in a deliberative system. Uh, different methods fit different policy contexts. And one way of categorizing those contexts is to think of citizen participation as an intervention in a policy making process from agenda setting to implementation. And different methods fit different purposes. Citizen assemblies are well suited for developing policy proposals. But if the task is to choose between already developed policy options, other methods are more suitable. Um, Some methods are better suited for local governance levels, other for the multinational or global level. When it comes to climate assemblies or citizens assemblies, I think it has enough uh, um, elasticity to be scaled both at the local and the multinational level. Um, right now, I can point to four cutting edge initiatives uh, and we're lucky to be part in three of them, the first three. And the first is the Global Assembly on Climate Change um, run by uh, Claire Millier Wilson and Rich Wilson in collaboration with uh, uh, I4Policy and uh, Iago and his colleagues from Deliberativa. Uh, and the second is the Global Citizens Assembly on Genome Editing, which is uh, initiated by the Center of Deliberative Democracy in Canberra, uh, which aims to establish global principles of governance of genome editing. And uh, the third uh, is the four citizen panels for the Conference on the Future of Europe. Um, they will have a key role in a pretty complex policy process involving also an online proposal platform, local and national events, and a plenary process, including both uh, uh, a whole lot of politicians and uh, different citizens. Uh, and the fourth is uh, the World's Citizen Assembly. 
which is in a built up phase. So is actually the Global Citizen Assembly on Genome Editing. It's, it's not being rolled out at the moment. Um, and all of these are multinational in scale and are in the process of finding practical solutions to challenges such as global random selection processes, translation issues, scale, use of software, combining core assemblies with distributed uh, events, et cetera. <laughs> So um, yes, they can be scaled both to the local and multinational level. And this is simply a question of method craftsmanship and engineering. Um, the bigger question is what role they could play exactly and whether other methods might be better suited. Uh, most of the current initiatives uh, seek the role of making proposals for governance, initiatives, policies, and so on, uh, in areas where the agenda is already somewhat uh, delineated. So uh, the Global Assembly on Climate Change has multiple policy targets, including the COP in Glasgow, um, and uh, still looking for other potential policy targets. Uh, the one on genome editing is to influence research and innovation. And although WHO is a clear target, it will have to interact with multiple uh, policy bodies to have an impact. Um, the conference on the future of Europe has a pretty clear hook. Uh, but since it includes both the commission, the parliament and the council, it's quite diffuse. Um, in comparison uh, with a few other multinational process, Civisti and Simulact, uh, they have very clear target in terms of um, formulating topics for a Horizon Europe uh, program and uh, the last program of uh, Horizon 2020. And there's the worldwide views, global citizen consultations that had a specific focus on targeting the COPs uh, and the negotiations on climate and biodiversity by targeting exactly both the national and the global level. So this is just, I, I mean, it, 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 I, I might go out on a, a sidetrack here, but this is just to illustrate uh, how, how these difficulties of connecting with uh, a policy context becomes even more difficult when you, when you go multinational. And it's already quite difficult at a national, uh, at a national level due to different timings uh, of legislation. Nobody knows up front uh, when who is going to decide anything about climate laws and, um, and, and the role uh, is still under negotiation and under certain. Um, yeah. So just to finish off, um, they, assemblies can be scaled, uh, they can be used for multiple purposes, but we should also think about scaling and using other methods. So there's no one size fits all. Um, and this is not because I don't like citizens assemblies, I do, but we just have to remember they're not the solution to everything. Um, and um, I think we should put an effort, an equal amount of effort into the practical exploitation, exploration of uh, the many different roles uh, they can play in different policy contexts. And especially how one can provide guidance uh, also to policymakers that initiate these citizen assemblies because they are, I would say, pretty lost at the beginning of such a process and uh, confronted with all kinds of different expectations, um, which, is not, which are not all of them uh, quite reasonable, I would say. 
Okay, that's enough for me. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much, Björn, for a thought-provoking presentation. If you would like to end your screen sharing, then we can have ourselves back on the main stage for everyone to see. And thank you so much for mentioning the Global Assembly, which is something that recently G1000 has also become involved in. Uh, we are now a cluster facilitator for, for one of the clusters of locations and working with the people you mentioned uh, very intensely. Uh, it's a very rewarding experience. And if, if anyone on this Zoom call wants to hear more about the Global Assembly, contact us at any time because it is something that we are very pleased to tell you more about. Bjorn, I had a few questions coming in from uh, some of the audience during your presentation. Um, one of them was about the, uh, the Danish Climate Assembly. Uh, where did it come from? Uh, how were politicians involved? And if you were to do it again, how would you do it differently? Thank you. I mean, it, it basically came from the political party called the, the Alternative Party. So, I mean, they, they, their political program from the outset was more or less twofold. One was to renew the political culture. The other was to have uh, a much bigger focus on the green transition. So it was their suggestions uh, brought into uh, the negotiations behind uh, the Climate Act. Um, I'm not sure, yeah, what would we do differently? I'm, I'm not sure how much we, we could do. I mean, we are, uh, I mean, we were hired by, uh, by uh, the Danish ministry. So sort of already there uh, within the confines of a certain mandate and, and a very small budget. So I would like to have a bigger budget uh, and would like also to, to put more effort into um, uh, public communication because um, there's a huge resource actually uh, available on the, on the Danish ministry's website in terms of background information panel discussions on select policy issues, which are all tailored to inform lay people. And it's a, and it's a huge uh, resource, that's one thing. But the other, of course, is, is to, um, to have had more time in terms of um, uh, discussing with uh, politicians, uh, what is the role of such a citizen assembly in uh, a Danish political context, what will people expect from them? What could they possibly make in terms, uh, what kind of promises could they possibly make uh, so, that, so that they could, could, could get a better understanding of the whole process and their role in it? Because I think that's what, I mean, that's a barrier for having a bigger impact uh, on the political system, I would say. Thank you. Um, then I've got one more question from a, uh, an audience member called Harm. He says, you, you've been using the word well-suited to, to sort of talk about processes and contexts. What exactly do you mean when you say well-suited? Um, but um, I, I used the example of, um, of uh, worldwide views process versus uh, a citizen assembly. A citizen assembly and a, another parallel would be um, a consensus conference, which the Danish Board of Technology also has worked with a lot, is at the early stages of, uh, of, uh, of finding out how to deal politically uh, with a new development. Um, these methods are well suited. So when you still don't know exactly what you're going to do, I think those methods work well because they are in depth, they, they take time uh, and, and they, they are constructed in a way so citizens develop their recommendations bottom up. The worldwide views process, for example, or citizen summits are much better suited if you're closer to making decisions about something and the alternatives are well known. So if the political alternatives are well known and it's just a matter of choosing between them, it doesn't make much sense to start a citizen's assembly. 
because then you 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 sort of um, give the fake impression that the policy landscape is open, but it's not. Thank you. So actually, what we're talking about is is the conditions uh, in which you start a, a participative I process. Guess, yes. Thank you. Okay. I, I want to thank you for answering these questions and and for informing us uh, about the the Danish perspective on this. Uh, we are going to move on to the next speaker. I hope to see you again in the panel discussion later in the afternoon. Uh, and the next person I'm going to call upon is Roman, Roman Huber, who is joining us from Germany. Uh, well, welcome to you, Roman. Uh, tell us where in Germany are you joining us from? The south. I'm from Bavaria. Okay. Which is not exactly in Germany, but... It's a country in itself, is it? Oh. I see. Okay, thank you, Roman. So uh, Roman is from Mea Demokratie, which is a well-established uh, organization, uh, membership organization in Germany that has been arguing for direct and participative democracy for many, many years. Uh, and Roman is one of its uh, founders and one of its directors. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased to hand over to him so that he can inform us a bit more about their work and the situation in Germany. Over to you, Roman. Thank you very much. So, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for having me and explaining a little bit the situation in Germany. As you already mentioned, More Democracy is a, an NGO. We focus on direct democracy and participation and the combination of the two pillars of direct democracy. So we, we have the triangle of parliamentarian, of parliamentaries, of citizens assemblies and direct democracy. This is where we focus on. And we are, so to say, um, an organization which is advocating. We also do something like documentation and we are a campaigning organization as well. So we have something like 10,000 members and 200,000 supporters to do political action. In the last uh, three years, we organized um, or co-organized three national citizens assemblies. You will find all the details in that link, Bürgerrat.de, that is the German word for citizen assembly, Bürgerrat. And there you can find all the details and so on. The first was on democracy and it was self-organized with the patronage of the head of the German parliament, Wolfgang Schäuble. That was very important to get the connection to the politicians. So the role and the task of that citizens assembly was to begin and to start with that format on a national level in Germany, which former was nearly unknown. Some guys, some people heard something about Ireland and so on, and there happened something. So we introduced that format to the German public and to the politics. Then we handed all, and it was on democracy. So on the discussion, should we introduce citizens assemblies and should we introduce instruments of direct democracies? That was the issue, that was the question. Then we handed over the recommendations to the parliament, to the chief of the party fractions. And then we came together with them and they decided to make a so-called model project in the um, responsibility of the German Bundestag. So they formulated the question. They gave, so to say, the instruction, but we um, still financed the whole thing. And the question was, what is the role of Germany in the world? That was not our favorite question. <laughs> we would have had a question like climate change or like traffic or agriculture, things like that, but that was not possible in that round. That was some to say, so to say, a compromise. And we also, the important thing is to get the conservatives in because they are in power. So we did that second assembly, 10 weekends um, in the beginning of that year. 
in cooperation with the administration of the German Bundestag. And that was the most important thing. It was not um, only about the recommendations on foreign policy and security and migration and things like that, but it was so to inform and to educate the parliamentarian administration how a citizen's assembly works. And they were in every meeting, in every staff meeting, in every Zoom call, they were with us. So they saw everything, also the thoughts we made and all of the things that it's never, never always is gonna perfect in such a progress as you know. And it was the first online citizens assembly in Germany on a national level. So that was challenging for us, but that also was trust building for the administration because they really knew what we did. And they made a report and perhaps I can um, share that because that is um, interesting. Is it possible to share that? You want to share your screen, is that it? Yeah. Yes, you can. You should have permission to share your screen. Should have permission, okay. So I think it does not work. Uh, we can I see will... your screen but probably not what you're trying to show. <laughs> Is that the right one? Uh, we, we can see the, we can see a picture of uh, Schäuble with yeah, some other people. That, yeah. that is the right, that is the right thing. And I will post the link in the, um, later. Um, that is on the official German Bundestag's website, a report, a evaluation report from the Bundestag's administration. And they advise and they recommend the implementation of citizens assembly, which is really uh, a big step. Then we organized some weeks later, an assembly on climate change and they produce really interesting content. So in the German's role of Germany, the politicians were inter interested on the, on the process and in the climate uh, change assembly, they were interested in the content. So now we have somehow proven that this instrument can work on a national level in Germany. And as you perhaps know, we have now in September national elections and we have a huge possibility of different coalition coalitions. So we tried or we um, started a advocacy campaign advocacy campaign and we um, analyzed which politicians will be part in the negotiation treaty after the election. Who writes the negoti negotiation treaty? And we analyzed 80 politicians and we now went in their constituencies and do panel discussions with them and their competitions in their constitution in their constitu constituency. That means we are right now organize, uh, organizing 40 panel discussions all on Citizens Assembly with 120 anchor candidates on um, Citizens Assembly. So that is really a challenge, but uh, in the time of Zoom, everything is possible. And we did a survey in every constituency in Germany in 300 parts, so they know the figures, how the people are in favor for citizens assemblies or not, and how they are in favor for the combination. So we are in the midst of that um, campaign. We have 20 um, discussions behind us and we have uh, the interesting combination that 80% of all politicians are in favor of citizens assemblies in Germany, no matter if they are left, conservative, social democrats, or um, the liberals. And that is for us really, interesting. So um, we focus on three things. We want after the election an implementation by law which regulates who can start and initiate a citizen assembly, who does the question, who formulates the question. Do we need something like an independent coordination office within the German Bundestag and how you deal with the recommendations. And you all know the different steps which, which are possible. And we want a law by that, that would be possible or change 
the rules of the German Bundestag. And the third thing is uh, what we um, focus on, we want a combination of direct democracy and citizens assemblies so that also the citizens can introduce a citizen assembly. So like as in referendum, you collect a certain amount of signatures, let's say 500,000 on a special topic, and then the German Bundestag is obliged to organize and finance a citizens assembly and is obliged to at least take, not, not uh, at least accept the recommendations and deal with it and evaluate it. So that is uh, our political aim. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting that in a few years, like three or four years, that um, topic citizens assembly is coming from near zero attention in Germany on a level that every parliamentarian must know what assemblies are and at least must be semi-informed what it is. Of course, not everybody knows in detail what it is. And it will be a topic in the next government and in the next coalition. And that is, I think, an interesting journey um, which we have behind us. And I think the reason is that um, politics know that our institutions have to adapt. And citizens' assembly are, on the one hand, a really intelligent tool. And on the other hand, it's not too dangerous for politicians. It does not raise the real power question. So it's something like a compromise which they can, um, which they can focus on and can have a consensus on. And we also try to create a narrative that uh, citizens' assemblies are nothing which should be dealt in the regular struggle between coalition and opposition. So that's beyond partisan interests. It's like a thing of politics and the citizens together. So we, we leave um, the, fee, the, the, um, the model or the, um, the principle of um, competition to a, a model of um, trust and believing in each other. So that is the story which we um, create um, on and around that. So that is in brief, the situation in Germany. We have a very um, strong partner in politics that is Wolfgang Schäuble, perhaps some of you know them. His, his, his uh, political track is a little bit, uh, not everybody loves him in the whole of Europe, especially Greece and other guys don't like him, but in his new role as a member of the parliament and as he is getting older and wiser, he really um, knows that the parliament has to do something to get the people in and to gap the bridge between, uh, to bridge the gap between um, citizens and parliaments. So that is in brief the situation in Germany. Thank you so much Roman, for these very inspiring words. Uh, Really interesting to hear about what's going on in Germany. Now, all of the uh, all of the developments that you're talking about seem to happen at the federal level. Uh, now, I'm also thinking about your country as a country where a lot of the power actually sits in the Länder, in, in, in yeah. the, the, the constituent parts of Germany. Uh, are you seeing the same developments happening in, on the federal level? And how does the federal level, or, or how does the, uh, the structure of uh, Germany impact on your national efforts? Yeah, um, it's pretty divided because on a communal and on the lender level, um, direct democracy and citizens partic participation is um, in use. Everybody knows that it's working, it's functioning, um, you can deal with that. And it's not really a question that this is, uh, that this is a well-known and accepted tool of democracy, especially on the communal level and also on the lender level. So we know that it works there. That is the reason why we focus on the national level, because there is zero yet. Thank you very much. There was a question from the audience, uh, from Jurian, who says, are you also looking at the uh, constitution of the German speaking part of Belgium, uh, where the constitution has been extended with deliberative tools? Is, is that an inspiration to you? Of course, that is an, a, a, a huge inspiration, but I think, for Germany on a national level, that goes far beyond the 
um, tolerance level of politicians because they always have something like an instant resistance when you attack somehow the dignity of the house. If there is something which is the better parliament, the better solutions, the better perspective, so they really react um, very instantly aggressive or like, like, like these two things uh, and more far reaching ideas like in Belgium, which I personally totally uh, are in favor of. Thank you very much. Uh, and for everything that you have told us so far, we are looking forward to continuing our dialogue with you in the panel session later in the afternoon. We are now going into a very short break for everyone to have an opportunity to just leave the screen, stretch the legs and do whatever you need to do. Roman, yes? Perhaps I can send you the link of the report of the German Bundestag. This is the website and uh, the link is uh, 23 pages. I think that is really interesting to read that link, uh, to read that report from the German Bundestag. Is it in German? Yes. <laughs> is it available in other languages? It's in German. Okay, but thank you very much. Perhaps, uh, yeah, you, you can read that. Uh, some of you can read that. I think so. I think many of us will be able to understand it. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, we'll make sure that we save this link so that after the event, we can also provide this information to anyone who wants to see it. Uh, so as I was saying, we're going into a five minute break. Uh, given that the time is now 13.37, that means we're going to try and be back by 13.42. That's our screens. And the next speaker I'm going to introduce when we get back will be Sarah Allen from the UK. Uh, into your break. Thank you very much into a big panel session where some of the speakers from the morning will also join uh, and where we will be able to exchange views and perspectives across languages, nations and uh, areas of interest. The next person, I'm very, very pleased that she's here to join us is Sarah Allen, who I know well from working with her in the UK. Um, Sarah is the um, head of capacity building and standards at a company called Involve, which many of you will know is, uh, is a very, very big player in the UK uh, on deliberative democracy and has produced many um, high profile citizens assemblies. And Sarah is one of the people behind uh, quite a few of those citizens assemblies, designing them in collaboration with colleagues um, and de delivering them as well. Uh, so she's, had, she's got firsthand experience of uh, citizens assemblies on a variety of topics. And I think the one she's going to focus on today for us is going to be the UK Climate Assembly. Um, so I'm very pleased to hand over to Sarah Allen. Uh, and uh, to start with, maybe you can tell us where you're joining us from, just as all the other speakers so far have done, so that we get a bit of an idea where we are. Yeah, I'm joining you from Northeast London. So we're not back in offices yet uh, in most of the UK, so I'm at home in my spare bedroom. I have a slide, shall I go ahead and share my screen, Remco? Yes, you can share your screen, yeah. Is there anything else you want me to cover before I start? Not at all, please please go ahead. Wonderful. I just want to say again, I'm really sorry to be late. I very silly didn't translate the times into GMT, so I, I apologise to the other speakers. I was really looking forward to, to hearing your presentations, and I'm sorry I wasn't here for them. Uh, so, as Remco said, my name's uh, Sarah Allen um, and I work for the UK public participation charity Involve. I was really lucky that as part of my job, one of the things that I got to do over the last couple of years is lead delivery of Climate Assembly UK for the UK Parliament. And what I was asked to cover today is a little bit about how we went about trying to create impact for that Citizens Assembly. Um, and you know, how successful that was, what has happened, what hasn't happened. It's a topic that I could talk about for a, a long time, for several hours. So what I'm gonna do is quickly touch on a lot of points and then to kind of set out the range of what I could cover. And then when we get to the breakout rooms later, if there's anything you want to pick up in more depth, we can talk about it in more depth then. So what I'm gonna cover then, just one slide on what Climate Assembly UK was so that we all uh, are on the same page about that. Then I'm gonna talk about impact on parliament 
impact on influences outside parliament and outside government, um, impact on government then, and a little bit on the impact on the assembly members themselves and the wider UK public. So about Climate Assembly UK, just to start with. Um, so Climate Assembly UK was the first UK-wide citizens assembly on climate change. It was commissioned by six select committees, so six backbench committees of MPs in the House of Commons, the UK Parliament. And Sarah? they- Yes. Sorry, I, I have a request. Can, can you slow yeah. down a, a slightly? I can, I was worried about time, but I, I will slow down. Um, so the committees commissioned uh, the assembly in response to the UK agreeing a new climate target of what we call net zero emissions by 2050. So the committees commissioned the assembly in the same month that the new target was set. And, and because when the target was set, it said what the target was, but not how the UK would get there. And so that's the question that the committee asked the assembly to consider. So the question put to the assembly was how should the UK reach its legally binding target of net zero emissions by 2050? The assembly had 108 members recruited through a civic lottery or sortition, um, as it's known. Those assembly members were representative of the wider population in terms of demographics, um, geography, and the level of concern about climate change. And they met over six weekends from January to May 2020. Three of those weekends were in person and three were online because of COVID. The assembly published its interim report on an interim report uh, on its views on COVID-19 recovery and the path to net zero in June 2020. And then it published its full report in September last year. Um, and just to mention briefly, the budget for the Assembly was £520,000, uh, rising to £560,000 due to COVID. We got a little bit of additional budget. Um, so that's quite a lot less than some other citizens' assemblies. So the French Convention uh, on the climate that you are probably aware of had a budget of over €6 million Euros by contrast. And that's a picture of some of the uh, Assembly members at the Assembly. So impact on Parliament, to start with that, because they commissioned the Assembly. So it's, oh, hello, that's all appearing very slowly. Come on. There we go. So to start with external context and what we did. So I'm going to start with the external context because it's really important. So Parliament's stated intention when it commissioned the Assembly was to use its results um, as the basis for detailed work on implementing the Assembly's recommendations. Um, on examining the policy issues raised by the Assembly, on scrutinising the steps that the government took or didn't take to get to the UK's climate target um, and to make proposals for new laws. So they said they were going to use the Assembly's recommendations to inform their work in all of those areas. Um, that might sound great, um, but it isn't. It has a problem. So within it is um, the problem that it, there's no clear mechanism, no clear direct mechanism that takes the Assembly's results into the committee's work. And that's unlike other citizens' assemblies we've run for parliament. And that's something I'm really happy to pick up in the breakout rooms um, if it's of interest to people. There were two other uh, problematic things uh, from the outset too. Um, so the first is that parliament wanted the assembly to be held outside of London. It didn't want to be seen as very London centric, but that's a problem if you want MPs to attend. And the most problematic thing that happened during the whole assembly process was a snap general election. So it wasn't expected. The committees commissioned the assembly in July and by the autumn there was a general election and after the general election almost all those original committee chairs who'd been enthusiastic and excited about the assembly were replaced uh, by new politicians as were many of their committee members and as well as that not being very helpful what it meant was that there were no committees in place while the assembly's plans uh, were being developed in fact until after the first assembly weekend so that's uh, clearly not ideal at all so what did we do um, so we briefed committees officials during the assembly's development uh, but obviously we couldn't brief the committees because they didn't exist we invited committee members to attend the assembly weekends a few of them did um, not as many as we would have preferred um, we then, when the Assembly reached its recommendation, briefed the committee officials and the committee chairs informally on what the Assembly had concluded. Um, and our colleagues in Parliament, so the officials who are working on the Assembly with us, um, really, pushed, uh, really pushed internally um, for then the committees to get ready to announce what their follow-up 
to the assembly was by the time the assembly launched its official results. Uh, when it did launch its official results, we provided formal briefings to the committees. So we met each of the committees on Zoom and ran through the assembly's results in the area that that committee looked at um, with them. And we also did a lot of social media and media, media work to kind of increase the profile of the assembly. So in the week um, that the uh, final report was launched, we had over a thousand pieces of media coverage um, to help. And we also haven't stopped um, trying to maximise the impact on Parliament. So next week, we're bringing 60 of the Assembly members to Parliament to meet MPs face to face for the first time, um, because we now can due to COVID. Move on. There we go. Um, so what did that result in? So some good set pieces. So when the Assembly launched its results, six committee chairs wrote to the Prime Minister uh, and opposition party leaders commending uh, the Assembly, asking for a formal government response, echoing the Assembly's calls for a cross-party approach. Uh, the committee chairs also spoke at the launch of the Assembly's report. Uh, one of them made a statement about the report on the floor of the House of Commons. They hosted a debate on the report on the in the House of Commons that was well attended by MPs and which included passing a motion commending the Assembly's work. And the Speaker um, is hosting the an anniversary events next week. So that's all pretty good. But in terms of that detailed promise for the committees to work on the Assembly, we've got a mixed picture. So the Bayes Committee, one of the committees where the chair is really enthusiastic about the Assembly, has done a lot. They've launched an inquiry into the government's response to the Assembly, um, including calling a minister to give evidence. And they've launched quite a punchy report off, off the back of that inquiry as well. Um, they've also done what they call mainstream, the results of the Assembly into the committee's work. So every time they run an inquiry that touches on a topic covered by the Assembly, all the committee gets a briefing on what the Assembly said. The other commissioning committees have launched inquiries uh, that look in detail at some of the areas covered by the Assembly, but the impact of the Assembly is less clear cut. So that's Parliament. So impact on influencers. So I did Parliament first because they commissioned the Assembly. I'm doing influencers next because this is what I feel we really got right. So um, starting with what we did um, in this case, so we had direct involvement from influencers, so stakeholders outside government and parliament. So we had four expert leads who worked closely with us on the design of the assembly. We also had an advisory panel, an academic panel and 48 speakers at the assembly itself. Then we collaborated with a PR agency who's a not-for-profit one who specialised um, in climate who already had a lot of the key contacts and with them we organised thematic briefings before each assembly weekend on the topics the assembly was going to look at so if we were looking at transport we did a briefing for transport stakeholders for example. We invited key stakeholders to observe the assembly weekends and they had a tailored program for them at the assembly weekends where they kind of watched parts of the assembly um, heard had briefings from people like me uh, and so on. We had a newsletter, we invited them to the report launch, we did briefings for them on the Assembly's results, again thematic, so on transport, on electricity, and so on. And they, those briefings were attended by over 400 individuals. Media and social media helped too. And we've kept in touch with those people over the last year with the newsletter, telling them about relevant inquiries and reminding them what the Assembly said about them, and we've invited them to the event next week. The external context is less important for stakeholders. They were sort of less aware, I think, um, and it had less influence, um, but they may have been aware of XR's calls for a citizens' assembly. Some of them certainly would have been. Um, also, local citizens' assemblies and juries on climate change were getting going um, at, during this time. And there are other national citizens' assemblies, for example, the ones in Scotland and France on climate, um, which some people would have been aware of. Screen's freezing. So what happened, uh, what happened then? So starting with the in general side. So um, we were, had a feeling that a lot had changed with stakeholders as a result of the assembly and we wanted to get some figures about it. So in February this year, we sent out a survey to all the organizations and individuals we were in touch with and some who had never responded to invitations, um, asking them to fill in a survey about the impact that the assembly had or hadn't had. So 166 organisations and individuals responded to that survey, which we felt was very good, really, and a sort of a, uh, indication of the reach that the Assembly had had. 
some of the results from the survey. So 123 people said that they've discussed the assembly with colleagues or work contacts. 130 said it had influenced their thinking about participation. Um, and 104 said it had influenced their thinking about climate. So we don't have comparable figures to that for the UK, and we haven't seen those figures for other assemblies internationally either, but it feels like a really good reach to us. And as well as the general reach, the assembly had um, a really big impact on some very key stakeholders outside government. So the Climate Change Committee is the independent committee that advises government um, on its climate change targets on how it should achieve them. And they had a key report out at the end of last year called the Sixth Carbon Budget. And the Assembly heavily influenced its report. So the committee's chief executive, Chris Stark, had been one of the expert leads involved in the Assembly, which I think really helped. But their main report included over 30 mentions of the Assembly. It also included a table comparing the committee's advice to what the Assembly recommended. The report itself um, called on government to have a public engagement strategy for net zero, which included uh, public having input into policy design and that's compared to their last report which didn't mention public engagement at all and the quote at the top there in italics is taken from the launch of their report where they were asked about whether the assembly had had an impact on them and they said we've taken their the assembly's advice we've constructed our scenarios to align to it so you'll see on diet change on flying on driving the sorts of trends that they the assembly members said they'd be happy with in future we reflected those in our scenarios and the Institute uh, for Government at the bottom there is just another organisation that's influential on government that, that the Assembly has had a definite impact on. So that's influences government then. So a little bit less to say on this. Um, going to start again with the external context if this slide will move on for me. Um, so it's important to know that the government in the UK isn't very keen on citizens assemblies and it's not very keen on them for a couple of reasons. So the first is that XR is calling for a citizens assembly and the government isn't very keen on XR. And the second one is that the Remain side of the Brexit campaign called for a citizens assembly and the government's not very keen on that either. So they're definite barriers that we face. Also, the PR organisation that we collaborated with on wasn't in place until just before the first assembly weekend and that probably made a difference as well. Um, in terms of what we did, um, my main thought is that we didn't do enough um, on government uh, before and during the assembly. We did afterwards, but not enough before and during. And what we did do was too much through parliamentary channels. So the committees had their usual ways of engaging with civil servants. And we went with that rather than organising something separate like we did for influencers. Once the assembly launched its results, we ran them thematic briefings for civil servants, again, you know, on transport and electricity and so on. And they were really well attended. So 400 plus civil servants attended those briefings, which was, again, we don't have a, a comparison, a comparison figure, but it seemed really good. We invited ministers to speak at events. Um, they sometimes said yes, they sometimes said no. And again, media and social media are helpful here moving on hopefully cool so we've had some good words from government i think i think that's fair to say so the then secretary of state for business alok sharma he's now leading work on cop spoke at the launch of the assembly's report um, he said that the work of the assembly would help to shape the work that they were doing in government over the critical next 14 months and that the report's recommendations were an important part of the evidence base for the developing the government's net zero strategy his successor as uh, business secretary quasi kwateng has said very similar things the government has taken this report extremely seriously initiatives such as the assembly play an important role in helping to develop policies that are achievable and fair uh, public engagement of this kind is absolutely necessary the government will continue to engage the public and so on and so on and also actually at an event run run by the institute for government quasi kwateng went further um, and said that he was supportive of more citizens assemblies and similar methods and he was trying to in encourage colleagues to be as supportive as he is so that all sounds pretty good but uh, what we don't know so so far the government's published the prime minister's 10-point plan on climate some of it uh, is very much in line with what the assembly said some of it a bit less so we don't know if it they changed the content of it because of the assembly's report or not because the government won't say um, 
Also, many of the government strategies, so it's key net zero strategy, and many of the strategies that sit under it aren't out yet. So it's also very hard to say whether or not they're going to reflect what the assembly says. And if the government doesn't say whether the assembly influenced their contents or not, it's going to be very hard for us to know, potentially. So that's government. And then finally, I feel like I've been talking for a while, um, looking at the impact on public, the public and assembly members. Ooh, strange order. So assembly members then. So as usual, I think with citizens assemblies, we had really strong results in surveys during and after the assembly about the assembly members, kind of the impact of taking part in the assembly on assembly members confidence, um, on the appetite to engage in decision making on whether there should be future citizens assembly and all of that kind of thing. Um, what we did do, which we think is more unusual, is we went back to assembly members six months later and asked them about the impact of the assembly on their views and behaviours on climate, um, because we were getting quite a lot of anecdotal feedback from assembly members on that area and we thought it was worth exploring. So of the 83 assembly members that did that survey, 83% of them have reported changes in their behaviours relating to climate and they backed that up. We asked them for, for what they were and they range from changing how they travel, changing their diet, changing what they buy, cha making changes at home, changing what, what they watch, what they read, what they talk about, and um, changes to their political participation, changes to their jobs even. So it's in quite profound impact. And I, I was really surprised personally at the scale um, of that. In terms of the wider public, um, so we made a decision at the beginning that we just didn't have the budget and resources to really target the wider public. I think that's important to say. And I think reflecting that there's quite low levels of awareness um, or very low levels of awareness of the assembly in the UK, despite the media coverage. And, and I think that's because in line with our view that we didn't really have the resources to do it, we targeted our media coverage at the publications that government and parliamentarians were most likely to read rather than at the ones with kind of a big public reach. Um, that said, um, what we do have now and since the last kind of polling on public awareness was done was a really good documentary. So we let a documentary team in to film at the assembly and they've created a fantastic um, one hour film tracking the journey of some of the assembly members through the assembly. Um, that is now available to people outside of the UK. It's on BBC iPlayer um, in the UK, but it is available at that link there, which I'm sure I can put in the chat and share with you separately. Um, I don't take any credit for it. It was made by someone else, but it's really good um, and I think will help to increase uh, public awareness. And the documentary team are also doing work around that, targeting the tabloids and the papers that are read a lot in the UK, working with the assembly members who are part of that documentary. So hopefully public awareness of the assembly is going to continue to increase it hasn't it hasn't stopped and i think that's my final slide and i'm I, it won't move on but i'm happy to as i said to pick up any issues within that and talk about them in more detail in the breakout group thank you so much sarah uh, really wonderful to hear and uh, what a complex context you have for uh, carrying out deliberative democracy uh, in the UK, especially given the political situation that you're dealing with. Now, what I found really interesting is how much of the work that you've been doing uh, is not about delivering the actual deliberation process, but is about measuring its impact, is about uh, creating uh, more impact. Was that part of your original brief or how did that become part of what you were doing? So I think it was something that we were always keen to see happening around the assembly and we were very lucky that the officials that we were working with in parliament were similarly keen to see the assembly have maximum impact and um, we were able to really resource it and do everything that that we I've just talked about because parliament agreed to work with this other not-for-profit PR agency on climate and they put in a lot of the legwork around that but it is something that we managed to involve we kind of oversaw it all because it had to fit with the assembly so when you had kind of journalists at the weekend, we had a lot of journalists at the weekend, when we had the documentary team at the weekend, we had to make sure that they weren't going to interfere with the running of the assembly. So I think it came about through kind of a shared ambition between us and Parliament, and it was possible because of bringing in that extra capacity of people to really focus on that when we were kind of very busy running the assembly itself. And I would just say that it's essential. I mean, I don't know if it is, it, 
so much the case in the Netherlands, but in the UK, you, we've run a citizens assembly for parliament before. It was actually, you could argue on parliament, more impactful because it was to inform a specific inquiry and the committee's inquiry report basically adopted the assembly's recommendations pretty much. But nobody's heard of it because we didn't do any, comp we didn't do all of this around it we just did the piece of work for parliament so i think if you are looking for kind of that wider cultural change that wider recognition um you really need to put in some work thank you very much and then i've got one question from the audience from louise uh, who asks uh, if you were to do the uk climate assembly again what's the one thing that you would do differently more money um, would be there because that would have made so many other things possible. I think within the budget that we had, I, I think I would have realised that, that not enough was happening to engage government um, and kind of made sure that we did do that and that we were briefing kind of ministers and civil servants all the way through. Um, it, it might not have been possible, but I suspect the civil servants briefings would have would have been. And I think that that would have been really helpful to the assembly's overall impact. Thank you very much. Uh, we will be seeing more of you later in the afternoon, both in the breakout and the panel session. Uh, I am going to focus next on the final speaker for this afternoon, and that's our friend Graeme Smith, who is Professor of Politics at the University of Westminster, and among many other things, he is also the founding chair of NOCA, uh, which is the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies. Um, he's written a book, actually he's written quite a few, but he's, uh, he's very recently published a book uh, called um, Can Democracy Safeguard the Future? Uh, and I think that is going to be the thread along his presentation. Uh, so uh, just like the other speakers, please tell us where you are joining us from and then you can just go into your presentation. Thank you. Over to Graham. Oh, hello there. Um, I'm joining you from... Um... I've just shared the screen wrongly, haven't I? I'm just join, joining you from Salisbury, which is near um, near Stonehenge, famous for being poisoned by the uh, famous for being poisoned by the uh, Russian Secret Service. Um, beautiful city. I'm just going to have to unshare my screen, and I can't quite figure out what I've done here. There's always one. Oh, there we go. Stop share. Right. Sorry. Um, right. While I'm trying to figure out what I did wrong I just like to there we go is that better it's it's the same but it's good yeah okay fantastic I had a double screen on I had two screens so I needed to turn the other one off I keep forgetting to do that um so first of all thank you so much for um inviting me it's a real pleasure and I've always um I've watched with interest over the years as G1000 has developed its uh, its method and its application and I'm I'm really pleased to have to have made have been have made it to your university. I'm just so sad that we can't be in person. Um, Harm asked me to talk a little bit about the book Can Democracy Safeguard the Future. Before I start, I just want to do a little advert, which uh, Bjorn um, ra raised the profile of in his presentation, which is the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies. Um, and uh, this is an organisation which has just been launched by the Europe, funded by the European Climate Foundation, which is trying to bring together. Um, policymakers, practitioners, uh, civil society organisations, um, media members of members of um, who have been members of climate assemblies to actually take forward practice. So we want to raise the understanding of what's going on. We want to provide advice to policymakers and to civil society organisations, and most importantly, we want to see improvements in the practice. And that relates to many of the things that uh, Bjorn, Roman, and Sarah have been talking about. And um, and, and I look forward to that being a place, a really exciting place of, develop, of developing um, of developments with, with climate assemblies. OK, so um, what I'm going to be talking about today is, is this book, as I said. Um, its main virtue is it's very short. So um, it's only a, it's only just over 100 pages, which I've been told by people uh, it, it, it is the it's about as much as academics should anyone should ever say to anybody. So. Um, I'm just going to be talking about a few themes of this. And the, the first theme, the theme that um, I guess um, motivates the book is the idea that democracies suffer from myopia. 
And there are a range of policy issues, and, I, and I'm putting them up here at the moment, like pensions, like climate change, like emerging technologies and the like, where democracies seem to be particularly bad at taking the long term seriously, at thinking about the interests of future generations. And I want to argue that there are a number of, re in the book I argue that there are a number of reasons for this, and I, I focus on four particular issues. The first is the absence of those people who are going to be most affected by these policies. One of the things that we know about politics from feminist writers, from, from, uh, from um, decolonial writers and, uh, and others is that if a particular population is not present when decisions are being made, their interests won't be taken into account fully. And so that's been the basis of, you know, sort of ensuring in, in increasing suffrage in terms of you know, trying to increase the number of women and ethnic minorities in parliament. That's all been about getting people to be present so that they can, that, so that the decisions reflect their interests. Well, that's just actually impossible for future generations. So that's one explanation why democracies, democracies are responsive to the people who are present and future generations just aren't. The second is a characteristic of our institutions, the, the electoral cycle. Um, party political motivations are such that political that, that actually long term issues are not necessarily in a, in a party's interest because they need to show at a regular on a regular basis, whether it's two years, three years, four years, five years, that they have responded to the interests of the of the electorate. And so therefore are looking at issues that they can deal with in, in within the within electoral cycles. At the same time, um, citizens, unfortunately, don't trust politicians to deal with issues that when they make promises over a number of years, like the kind of net zero at 2050, they don't necessarily trust politicians that to, 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 to act now with that, with that long-term um, gain, um, that long-term uh, issue uh, in mind. Thirdly, we've got the problem of entrenched interests. And for those of us who may be involved, been involved in climate politics, we're well versed in the way that entrenched interests in the uh, fossil fuel economy have been able to uh, undermine progress on climate action in, over the last 30, 20 to 30 years. And the same is true in other policy areas as well. So we've got these kind of entrenched interests that make it incredibly difficult to deal with some of the long-term interests because, because the, they have a short-term interest in, in um, continuing the kind of practice that we see at the practices we see at the moment. And finally, um, you can point to certain dynamics within the capitalist system, whether it's to do with uh, the, the way that media works or whether we're talking about the way that um, the way that production and consumption systems structure our everyday practices, making it very difficult for us as individuals and organizations and others to think long term. The short term is king, if you like. So there are, run, there are a number of reasons why democracies find it difficult to, to deal with long term issues. And I've, I've offered four ways of thinking about it. Others have suggested other formulations. So the question, I guess, is ditch democracy or reinvigor reinvigorate democracy? My guess is you've probably, given that I've been invited to this, uh, to this um, uh, university, would, are going to understand that I'm going to go for the second option. But we should recognise the, the kinds of ideas that are in play in terms of ditching democracy. We do see a rise of anti-democratic sentiments, both at a popular level, and also at an elite level. So for example, these are quotes from two of the two very well-known scientists in the UK, Lord Martin Rees, um, who said only an enlightened despot could push through the measures necessary to navigate the 21st century safely. And James Lovelock said, I have a feeling that climate change may be an issue as severe as war, it may be necessary to, to put democracy on hold for a while. And so, they're, you know, these are these are very mainstream voices within the scientific community, um, and state that you can find these kind of comments all over the place. I think there's lots of reasons why we should be concerned about this kind of idea of sort of enlightened scientists or enlightened authorit authoritarianism, because we've never seen enlightened authoritarianism. Actually, most authoritarian regimes are really bad at dealing with complex issues. Our, our current democracies outperform autocracies on almost all policy issues, on almost all long-term policy issues. It's just they don't do well enough. Authoritarian systems do much worse. And we can talk about this perhaps in the, in the breakout group. By the way, in terms of the breakout group, I'd actually rather go to, I, I'd like to go to the other three breakout groups. So I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna deal with this, but uh, there we go. So, so my question, I guess, in the book is, how can we design democratic institutions 
that more that deal more effectively with long term issues, deal more effectively with the interests of future generations. And the book is not an attempt to be comprehensive in this. It's not an attempt to look at every democratic institution we have. But what I did is I selected um, four institutions where I thought there were there are interesting developments. The first is legislatures. I'm, I'm not going to talk about these in much detail, but you know we see the development of parliamentary committees, particularly the Finnish uh, Committee for the Future is a really interesting development. We're seeing proposals for changes of electoral rules to, to think about representatives of future generations. We've seen I ideas about trying to change the balance of power between different parts of the electorate. I said I can talk about these in more difficult time in more detail another time we're seeing especially new constitutions emerge where there are substantive and procedural rights where where current generations can can take action on behalf of future generations in fact we've seen this i think in the dutch courts we've seen people use uh, you know uh, constitutional um, amendments in order constitution constitutional um we sorry take take the government to court for failing to ach to achieve its uh its protection of, of, of younger people, if, I, if, I, if I'm remembering the case correctly. Um, thirdly, we're seeing the emergence of some really interesting independent agencies for future generations. Israel and Hungary had these agencies for a while, but they were in both countries, they were, they were abandoned. It was a slight irony. The politicians established these agencies to try and, um, as a way, because they realized the dysfunction is, dysfunctionalities within the electoral system, they realized that they were operating short term. Uh, and then they abolished the institutions when they realized that they were stopping them acting short term. So there were there's a real problem there. The Welsh, the Welsh um, Commissioner for Future Generations is actually having really significant effect, it looks like, on the politics of Wales. And very recently, the Welsh government announced it would it would invest no new money in roads. It would build no new roads. And it, its money for the road building program would go into public transport and we're going to safety on existing roads. It just said, in terms of future generations, it is madness to be building our, trying to build our way out of, uh, out of the, the um, mobility problems we have. So some really interesting, and we can show an impact there of the Welsh commissioner. But what I'm gonna be talking about for the rest of this talk, because it's what, it's what um, uh, the G1000 University is, is about, is, is why I think deliberative mini publics are particularly interesting spaces for dealing with long-term issues. And you know, there's a, I just want to give you a sense of the the scale, or, and many of you know this already. And you know, um, G1000 is in, in the in, is in is in the slide. But just the sheer scale of activity that's going on here, I want I want to stress that it's still a, it's still a marginal political institution. It's not being used all the time everywhere. Sometimes when you read, um, particularly some of the academic work on this, it's as if these things are making decisions everywhere. They they clearly aren't. But what's really interesting is there is there is this. This, this way, what the um, OECD call a deliberative way of practice across, um, ac across particularly Western Europe and um, North America and in, and, in, and in other countries as well. So particularly across advanced industrial democracies. And that this has already been mentioned by, by the other speakers all involved in this in some way or another. What I'm particularly interested in, um, because of Kanoka, because of the work of the Knowledge Network, and just because I think it is really interesting, is this wave of um, climate assemblies that have happened. And what I think is particularly uh, noticeable about that is they've been happening at national level. Um, and most assemblies prior to this were happening at local level. Not all, but most of them were happening at local level. And secondly, because actually what, what's coming out of these assemblies are recommendations that are so far ahead of where government is. And I think it's a really interesting, interesting moment in time. Here I particularly, I, I mean, you know, I could look at any of these assemblies, but the extent to which the French assembly has really changed public discourse around climate change because of the lack of, lack of response by the government has been, has been really interesting. But I think all of these projects have been absolutely fantastic, absolutely groundbreaking. There's, each of these projects has got problems with them, but we must remember or, or limitations to them. And Sarah was talking about some of the limitations she thinks of uh, in terms of the relationship with government of the UK one. Of course, it was never for government. But we have to remember that. But, um, you know, this is this is groundbreaking stuff. And you know, if you'd asked me three or four years ago, would any of this happen? I would have said no. So it's really quite, 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 quite amazing, I think. 
Why do I think that these bodies are particularly good at dealing with long term issues? It's actually this combination of random selection and deliberation. I just want to break this down a bit. So random selection, I think, is really critical for two reasons. The first is it brings it brings together a diverse group of people. And that means you have a variety of social and cognitive perspectives on, on the problem at hand. And most importantly, it brings into the room a diversity of perspectives on the interests of future generations. One of the problems about most of the future generations institutions I've been talking, I, I mentioned earlier, is they are elite institutions. They are institutions of and for politicians or judges or, 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 or particular public officials. And one of the problems about that is, is I think that limits the consideration of future generations. I think one of the things we know is, that, and I mentioned this earlier, is political elites often don't understand the lives of people, of, of, who are of people who are living differently from them. And one of the things about future generations is we often think about them as a single entity, but actually within, a, within any future generations, we're gonna see injustices and we're gonna see imbalances of power. And I think people in the present generation who are differently situated will understand the interests of future generations differently. And I think it's really important to have that sort of rich understanding within a room. The second reason I think um, random selection is really important for, um, for long-term thinking is the question of independence. These bodies are independent of the electoral system. They're independent of party electoral motivations in terms of the, the actual functioning of the body. And secondly, they, they are independent from the strategic action of entrenched social and economic interests. And that's actually why I think many of these assemblies come up with progressive uh, positions which are different from that of government, which are which push forward, push against sort of the powerful, powerful interests. Secondly, I want to suggest that deliberation is particularly important for thinking about long term. Deliberation ensures fairness and equality. It ensures that ideas are thought of, uh, you hear competing perspectives. It allows for slow thinking rather than the kind of reactive responses that we have to things. And it orientates people towards the common good. There is a, that's sort of how deliberation, that's what deliberation does to people. And what that means is that deliberation tends to be fact regarding. It means that deliberation seems to be other regarding and we think about other people. And it means that people, particularly when they're thinking slowly, when they have the chance to reflect on things, they think more about the, they take into consideration more the long term. They take into consideration the future. It's just one of the characteristics of deliberation. And, and all of those things, if we think about climate change, you know, being fact regarding, taking seriously the science, taking seriously the position of people who aren't like you, who are living in different circumstances from you, and taking into consideration those people who don't yet exist, it's a rare institution that allows that sort of thing to happen. And secondly, it is really difficult in a public, in a public, you know, in public deliberation to justify shifting burdens to other people, to people who aren't there. It's a really difficult thing. It's something you can do on the, on the quiet, but it's not something you can do and justify publicly in the way that we see uh, assemblies don't come out saying, screw the future. You've never seen an assembly that says, let's just, Let's just look after ourselves and not the long term. So there is something about deliberation that orientates people to the long term. So my last slide or my last substantive slide is, I think there's some out of what I've done, out the work of the book, um, I kind of come up with five design principles that I think are really important for helping us to develop future regarding institutions within democracies. The first is independence. And this isn't just about, this also reflects back to offices for future generations, it reflects back to other institutions that I looked at, but independence from electoral cycles, from um, the entrenched political interests become really critical political spaces for thinking about the long term. Secondly, is this issue of diversity in order, it, it may, creating a space where we have a diversity of perspectives on the long term. Third is deliberation, this idea of creating space for slow thinking, for consideration of, different, of differently situated others. The last two I think are really important and we can reflect on some of this from what other people have said so forth, is empowerment. These, these bodies actually need to have some power. Now that doesn't mean they have to, and, and I'll reflect what Bjorn says, this doesn't necessarily mean they have to have decision-making power. It, it isn't either 
consultation or decision making. There are other things in between. And some of the interesting things, for example, the, the Israeli Office for Future Generations had the right to delay legislation. That was a really interesting function because what it did was it, it stopped, it, 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 he, he was able to stop the legislative process or, or stop and ask people to reflect on, ask politicians to reflect on the long term. We can imagine with deliberative, deliberative processes, like the example of the Ost-Belgian model, the East Belgian model in, um, to, with their parliament, the parliament is actually required to, to, have, to set up a special committee to, to, to respond to the assembly. And that the assembly actually becomes and is present at when that response is made. So there are ways of empowering these these activities, all the way from you know these these kinds of these kinds of veto veto opportunities right the way through to decision making. And finally, I think we need to think really creatively and carefully about how to institutionalise these. Many of the assemblies that we've been talking about today are one offs. And I think what's really interesting about Denmark is that they may actually be in the process where they are in the process of thinking about whether or not there should be a ongoing process of climate assemblies. In all the other countries, it's been one assembly and then that's finished. And I really think this idea about how we institutionalize things like deliberative processes, like offices for future generations and other modes of engagement are absolutely critical. So um, buy the book, visit the website, Send me an email. Thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for uh, letting me letting me attend today. It's been really really interesting. Thank you so much, Graham, for sharing all of this with us. And uh, I think that that's given us a lot to think about and a lot to chew on. Uh, and uh, of course, there will be opportunities to speak to you in the breakout room later. Some questions came in through the chat. I want to invite the people who put those questions to put them straight to you if they're happy to do that. So have we got Nikki van Dijk? Do you want to put your question to Graham, Nikki? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, hi Nikki. I'm uh, a PhD candidate from Australia working on exactly what your book is about on representing future generations and young people. And I'm interested in how what you think about including young people or even children themselves in climate assemblies to give a different perspective, um, or if you're aware of this already happening somewhere. Thank yeah, you. so, so, so I'll, I'll say two things, Nikki. I think it's a really, really interesting, really important question. The, fir the first thing is um, there are there is some interesting debate about whether or not um, young people are, a, and you know, I don't want to have a go at young, are able to deal with the kinds of, you know, seven weekends of, deliberation at that, that degree of intensity. It's a really interesting question. We've certainly seen some assemblies drop down to the age of 60, which is really important and absolutely significant. Um, and so the, I, I, ha, I don't have a view as to whether or not they can or can't. That's an empirical question. It needs to be, we need to see some, some more work on that. Um, secondly, um, I think there are arguments for oversampling younger people in climate assemblies, as in having more people from the age of 16 to 25 or whatever, who are gonna be around for longer. So I think there's an argument to be made there. Um, and finally, I think, have a look at the Scot, I don't know if you've looked at the Scottish Climate Assembly, they've actually worked with the, um, with the young people's parliament and also with schools as part of their deliberative process. And the report of the climate, the, their engagement with young people was fed into the committee, it was fed into the assembly as, as, as evidence. And the final report of the assembly intertwines their recommendations with those recommendations that came out of the engagement with young people. So I don't know whether we can have younger people going through the same intense process. I just don't know whether that's possible. But integrating, if it isn't possible, integrating the kinds of ways that the Scottish Climate Assembly have done. I'd be really happy to hear what Sarah thinks about this because I know she's done a lot of engagement with young people and there is a really live debate about this, but I'm, I'm, any way we can do to bring those voices in and make them present is absolutely critical. Thank you. Is that, is that an answer to your question, Nikki? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your PhD, by the way. <laughs> uh, I've seen that there's quite a few more questions coming in now, but perhaps you can take those into the breakout with Graham later. I just wanted to get Lucia to ask her a question because she was the first one to put a question to Graham. Lucia, do you want to put your question yeah. to Graham? Yeah, thanks, Franco. Um, Hi, so Lucia. Graham, 
Yeah, hi there. <laughs> Graham, you mentioned that three years ago, these climate assemblies would have been unfathomable, right? So, so I was wondering, well, why, why did they happen? What, what is actually shifting? Because I think that would be really important for us to understand. What's your take on that? Yeah, Thanks. yeah. So, so I have a number of, uh, there are a number of reasons. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I, um, no, I'll, so let's see if I can go through go go through stuff. First of all, the the, the Irish the Irish Citizens Assembly was really critical in terms of raising the idea that there could be a national assembly. So that was absolutely you know raising it to the idea that these that this could be a national significant post. That that doesn't explain why climate change, although they did do climate change, it wasn't really discussed. The second thing I think is, um, in 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 France was the movement of the yellow vests. And in the UK was the kind of um, was the pressure from organisations like um, Extinction Rebellion and from um, Fridays for the Future, raising the idea of it. Now, I, I agree with Sarah, actually, that's caused had some problems because now it looks like a, a thing of the climate movement and not, you know, it means conservatives are often are often worried about it. Thirdly, I just want to say there are some really significant um, policy. There are significant policy entrepreneurs in here. And what I mean by policy entrepreneurs are people like Sarah Allen in the UK, who actually were, while Extinction Rebellion on the street shouting, we want a climate assembly, Sarah and her colleagues are doing the work, doing the hard yards and talking to uh, politicians and, and policymakers and others. And thirdly, fourthly, and it related to that last point, is there'd already been a sort of proof of concept, as in we'd already had a couple of assemblies which Sarah had been involved in and, and uh, which she mentioned in, in um, France, there was a kind of movement for this. So there's a kind of co there's a there's a um, funny kind of idea within um, policy studies, which is that policy making is like a garbage can. You've got problems floating around, and you've got solutions floating around. And so sometimes you put your hand in and you pull out a solution and a problem. And that problem, the solution was getting was getting larger in size. So it was kind of you were more likely to more likely to pick it up. And so I think there is this con. Uh, none, no, no one of those things would have been enough. And I'm, I'm sure Sarah and others would have other reasons as well. Um, but there is now, you know, that that's the kinds of things that I think had to be in place for, for it to happen. Does that, does that polarization? Yeah, definitely. I think polarization might also, might also, you know, the increasing polarization in countries. Might, might... Yeah, I don't know about, I don't, I don't know about that. It's, it, hmm. it, that's, that's an interesting one. I mean, it may be that polarization that citizens assemblies are seen as a response to polarization. I heard someone say the other day that 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 politicians may be more and more interested in climate assemblies as a way of dealing with polarization. Um, of course, I don't think climate assemblies can deal with polarization on their own. I think there's a broader politics here, and I do I do worry as some. So for, I am someone who promotes climate assemblies, but I am someone who also wants to say they aren't the answer to everything. You know, and, and I think there's a real problem at the moment that. There's this sense that we can run a few citizens assemblies and our politics would be would, would be would be fine. I don't think that's the case at all. Lovely. Um, thank thank you both for for this interesting exchange. Thank you. Uh, we are now going into a break, a fifteen minute break, after which we're going into some breakout rooms. So just a few uh, helpful things about getting into those breakout rooms. Uh, my colleague Jentel is going to open them very shortly. Um, so as you are still enjoying your break, you can have a look at what options are available. The, the breakout rooms will all have